Shall we kick things off? Let's rock and roll. Okay. Time to business for business. Katie, let's uh, let's get going. So quick quick ground rules for today. Um, as I said, we love questions, so drop them in the chat, and uh, we should have a bunch of time at the end. So if you leave a question in the chat or in the Q&A, we're going to try to get to it. As always, we've got a couple pre-submitted questions. So for the rest of the lessons coming up, don't be shy. Get your questions in because um, we love to, to help as directly as we can, even in this webinar format. So um, quick disclaimer, this presentation, including commentary, audio, text, is for information purposes only and uh, does not constitute legal advice. You got good lawyer, and there's going to be lots of ways for you to figure out how to use good lawyer um, to the best of its abilities throughout the show today. So uh, with that, let's get rocking and rolling. Start up series, you want to? Sure. Yeah. So uh, welcome everybody to lesson two in the Good Lawyer Summer Startup Series. This is our, yeah, lesson number two of our seven part uh, series that we've put together here, which is really designed uh, and focused at the startups and the startup founders out there to help you level up your business. Honestly, it's what I wish I knew three years ago. So we're trying to condense it down into six weeks, seven lessons, and uh, really help our fellow Canadian startups start in a place that they can build off of and uh, you know try to be those, those unicorns that we're always dreaming about. Right on. Right on. So next slide, Katie. Uh, and just to reiterate, so these are the rest of the live startup series. And as always, you can find the recordings on our YouTube channel. Just go Good Lawyer YouTube and you can't get lost. Um, but these are the dates for our upcoming ones. Like I said, six weeks for startup founders to level up. So uh, we'll give you a second. If you want to take a snap of that, make sure you get in your calendar. And as always, there should be lots of easy ways through Good Lawyer to find out how to register. So uh, we'll keep trucking. There See we go. Yeah, so this is me. Uh, quick recap from lesson one for those of you that are uh, just joining us so you can sort of uh, get on the same page. In, uh, in lesson one, I introduced the concept that will be recurring as long as you're hearing from me in this startup webinar series. Uh, keep it tight. Tight is right. So, tight is right. Yeah. Um, in lesson one, we talked about incorporation. But we talked about more than that. We actually talked about um, kind of these three fundamental reasons for why it's so important for you as a startup founder and for your company uh, to prioritize and think about having plans in place for legal organization. And the three principles or the three main reasons that I want to leave you with that or sorry, remind you of uh, from what we talked about last time. Uh, first one is compliance. So that really means there's a ton of rules out there. And when you're operating a business, uh, you have to comply. You have to uh, navigate the legal world that you're stepping into and follow the rules. Number two, operational efficiency, having a great legal structure, legal organization, and clean, tight legal documentation is going to help your business operate smooth, operate quickly, deal with stakeholders efficiently. Uh, so it's going to help you be more effective, more efficient. And number three, mitigating risks. Um, when you have clean, tight, and organized legal documentation, this helps you uh, prevent, avoid, and uh, not make lots of the common, common mistakes that startups and startup founders make all of the time. And those mistakes can lead to uh, delay in closing deals. Uh, they can uh, result in increased transaction costs. And in uh, the worst case scenarios, those types of mistakes can blow up otherwise really good ideas. There's a reason all the big enterprises, you know, the bigger the company, the more lawyers they have at their disposal. And that's really where me and Josh are coming from, because we used to work in those big corporate settings. And there's a reason you got to view setting your company up legally for success as an asset, as opposed to just simply a hoop you have to jump through. Um, and that's something that, you know, I learned a bit as a lawyer, but honestly, I've learned it more since founding my own company and having to deal with the the day to day, as well as the big picture stuff and trying to figure out how legal fits in and how to do it all right is, is something that frankly, not a lot of founders are going to be able to do on their own. So for me, it was important to find someone you trust or a collection of lawyers you trust and lean on them when you need help. So 
I'll leave it there. Katie, let's keep trucking. Awesome. So today's mission is going to be delivered to you by Josh. Yeah. So uh, we're going to follow up kind of on the theme that, uh, that we touched on last time around uh, the importance of kind of having a strong uh, legal footing and organization. And we're going to apply that now in the context of looking specifically at intellectual property and your IP strategy. So uh, the mission today is we want to help develop your understanding of basically how intellectual property can um, drive value in your startup. Um, so in order to do that, in order to get there, we're going to look at a few things. First, we're going to talk about what is intellectual property. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the types of things that you need to ask yourself con and consider to understand whether you need an IP strategy. And if you do, what can you do to start protecting your IP? Absolutely. What is it? Do you need it? And how do you get started is really the mission for today. And I just want to leave everyone thinking, you know, right at the get go, viewing law and getting your legal ducks in a row as an asset. If you're looking in the future to raise investor money, IP is going to be critical to so many startups. Like it's part of my investor package. We talk about the IP that we're getting a good lawyer because it's important to the value maintain. Like you create the value with building a brand, but if you don't protect it legally, then someone's liable to come take it away from you. So um, that's really what we're going to dig into today. We're going to get into all that. Yeah. Katie, let's keep going. Okay, quick one. You guys have already heard enough from me, but I am uh, one of the co-founders and the CEO of this little company called Good Lawyer. Uh, I spent four and a half years actually working with Josh at one of the big national firms. Uh, our headquarters was in Calgary and uh, learned a ton, met some great people, but ultimately saw how broken the system was. And uh, I was able to bring this guy over a couple of years later and we're trying to build something better. We're trying to build something that fits, that makes sense. And frankly, the billable hour and the surprise bills never, never worked for me. And uh, I know it didn't work for a lot of my clients. So that's enough about me. Awesome. So uh, thanks for, for um, joining us, everybody. My name is Josh Weinberger. I am the chief legal officer of Good Lawyer. Um, as Brett mentioned, I, we work together in um, the big law context in a national law firm in Calgary. I worked there for six years, and um, I guess my practice before joining Good Lawyer and uh, the lens that I'm bringing to today's conversation and the, the tips and tricks and lessons that I'm going to share with you guys is as uh, primarily a transactional lawyer. So uh, by no means, and I am an uh, an IP expert, and we're going to flesh out uh, through this presentation and webinar today a lot of the reasons why you should be engaging a, an IP expert, of which uh, we have uh, available through the Good Lawyer platform. But what I bring to the picture is basically uh, my understanding of IP in the context of doing deals, buying and selling companies, raising money, these major milestones that businesses encounter along the way. And I've seen lots of circumstances where not having your IP organized, well-protected, and having a really good plan in place has really turned some of these events that should have been really, really exciting milestones in the sort of uh, business roadmap of, of some of my clients into really stressful, really expensive, and really hard transactions to get over the line. So that's the lens I'm bringing. A lack of an IP strategy could be a deal breaker. You know, that's my feeling. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So avoiding deal breakers, that's what we're about. And again, this whole startup series, we're trying to be practical about it. We know that we're not going to teach you how to be an IP lawyer in an hour long webinar, just like we couldn't teach you how to be, you know, a business structure lawyer in lesson number one. But we're trying to give you those practical tips and, and really what my strategy has been in utilizing a guy like Josh to help flesh this out. And then, as he said, find the right expert for the, each problem. So we don't go to Josh when we need a trademark. We go to a trademark lawyer and Josh quarterbacks it. So you got to start thinking, how do I get the right help at the right price at the right time? Okay, Katie, let's uh, let's get to the meat of this one.
That's you. Okay, so back to our mission. Uh, step one of, uh, of getting there is really understanding um, these different forms of IP. What are we talking about when we're talking about IP? And on this slide and the, the ones coming up, we fleshed out a few of the common forms of intellectual property that you might encounter or utilize uh, in the context of running your, your startup business. So the first one on the list here, trademark. Trademarks, when we're talking about trademarks, we're essentially talking about brands, logos, combination of words and colors that are used to identify a particular good or service. So uh, a trademark must relate specifically to a category of a good or a category of a service. So um, another important thing to understand with trademarks is that uh, a trademark gets registered uh, to protect you and uh, grant you exclusive rights over that mark in a particular jurisdiction. In Canada, you can register your trademark, your trademark, and it will give you 10 years of protection and exclusive use of that mark in connection with that particular good or service. Um, those can be renewed for subsequent indefinite terms of 10 years at a at a clip yeah so if you think of coca-cola they've been renewing that trademark for you know 100 years so the 10 years you've got to pay again but the amount of protection it gives you comparatively to just common law rights which we're going to touch on with one of our lawyer answers uh towards the end of the show today um is immense and it's you know i'm always thinking about the cost benefit what's the risk What's the value creation? What's the cost? So you have to do that weighing yourself as a startup founder. But for me, getting a trademark, that was the that was actually the first job ever booked over Good Lawyer. That was the right. Good Lawyer, the Good Lawyer trademark. Jad, never forget you. So that's that's the trademark that we're we're getting in Canada and the States. And that's to protect our brand and that, that we're working so hard to build through things like today's webinar. Yeah. So I guess the last thing to leave you with on trademarks. Um you are building a brand, you're building a business, probably worth thinking about investing in protecting your trademark. And uh, when you're making that investment and you're having that thought process, thinking about the jurisdictions that you actually need to protect that mark in Canada, US, foreign, whatever it may be. Um, the next one on the list here, patents. When we're talking about patents, we're talking about technology, we're talking about inventions, all right? So in order for, um, uh, a piece of intellectual property to qualify and meet the test for being uh, a patent. Uh, it must be novel, it must be useful, it must be inventive. Um, we could flesh that out a little bit, but really um, that's where the experience and expertise of a skilled and um, experienced patent agent lawyer will help you to flesh through whether you have something uh, a technology and invention, whatever it may be, that is suitable for patent protection. Totally. And, and patents, I mean, obviously they're more affordable on good lawyer, but they're not cheap. They're a ton of work for lawyers to do. And so it's really a pretty strategic decision whether or not you want to get one. And frankly, sometimes they don't make sense. So I was speaking with a startup founder just the other day, Robbie Pride, mm. and uh, you know, thinking about whether a patent or a trade secret made more sense. And the smart kid he is recognizes that a patent's only good for so long. And if you're Coca-Cola, you don't want any, anyone to know the formula ever. So this is where the IP strategy comes in. And it's so important is knowing which steps to take um, before blindly going in because, you know, you heard that you might need a patent from a friend. Yeah. And so one thing to identify there that um, Brett's hitting on, and I'm, I'm sure that not everybody knows this, part of the process around securing a patent is that you actually have to completely detail and disclose all of the particular um, details, nuances, and uh, unique features of your invention. And you file that, what we're talking about in the Canadian context now, you would file that with a government agency, and all of that information becomes publicly available. Now, the patent buys you um, 20 year window exclusive right where you can block other people out other actors and businesses out from using that technology but at the expiry of those 20 years 
now you're going to have gen, you know, generic forms of that patented technology coming into the space to compete with you. It becomes fair game. And that's where uh, one of uh, the other forms of IP that we'll speak about, a trade secret, comes into play from a strategic standpoint. Beautiful. Let's roll. Industrial design. Uh, in, if you're Googling and, and kind of searching for IP stuff online, uh, in the U.S. context, they sometimes refer to this as a design patent. An industrial design is similar to a patent, but we're protecting um, features that relate to appearance and design rather than functionality. Um, a design or a industrial design is a registered uh, form of intellectual property. It's going to last and secure exclusive rights to that, uh, to that particular design for a period of 10 years. Uh, in my context, this is a little bit of my kind of like nerdy design sign uh, side of things, but uh, one of the saddest things for me uh, that I will miss the most about uh, leaving Big Law was my beautiful, beautiful Herman Miller office chair, which was uh, almost certainly protected by industrial design. Yeah, we don't, can't afford that. <laughs> um, Copyright, uh, the next one on my list here, copyright is a kind of a unique one. Copyright is a form of intellectual property that relates to kind of artistic, original, whether it's uh, music, literature, that type of thing, um, unique works of art, unique works of, works of expression, that type of thing. Including code. Including code, there you go. Code, that's a work of art. No? It is, yeah. it is. Parker would tell you the same thing. Yeah, exactly. So the interesting thing about copyright, you do not have to register copyright in order for uh, copyright to exist. It basically exists by virtue of creating the original work itself. Um, and copyright lasts for a period of 50 years from the death of the author. Um, you can register copyright. You can put uh, the little uh, C sign with the circle on your copyrighted works to put people at notice that, you know, this particular uh, piece of, of work is protected by copyright. Um, yeah, and timestamp, and I'm pulling that from our masterclass series. The date, if you, you need proof of when it was created. So that's really important. Um, that's a big piece of what the copyright registration would do, but there's other ways to do it as well. Um, making sure you have a timestamp on the date of that work is really important because it proves that it was yours before someone else took it and used it. Yeah, you know what, that's a kind of a key overarching feature I think that we can uh, just mention in the overall context of uh, intellectual property. There's sort of this idea of kind of a um, first use, um, first to register is, is kind of this underlying theme of if you've if you've registered first or if you've been using the ip first or if you've created it first that's what you want to be able to establish to the world whether it's through registration or a timestamp or that kind of thing um, to be able to lock out others and prevent others from copying your ideas and stealing the value in your intellectual property totally and, and it's about that proof right like how does someone know that we came up with good lawyer logo a few years ago because we've we submitted our trademark applications saying so. And without that, it would be easy for someone else to say, well, I came up with good work. Yeah, exactly. It really pissed me off. But um, that's the importance is, is getting that record. And again, you can, it, it's also, again, that weighing of how much protection do you want? Registering it with the government in one of the IP registration databases is the, always going to be the most secure because there's a, a government record of your IP. There's other ways to protect it. Like I said, the timestamp on copyright, um, but getting those registrations in for things that you really want to protect. And for us, it's not even just good lawyer, the name. We have sub trademarks that we're now looking at getting and actually one we've submitted recently um, for some of the products because what we're selling is pretty unique and we want to make sure that we own the name um, and the phrasing for those unique products. So this isn't a one-time, mm -hmm. a one-time thing. This is a continuous um, strategy that needs to be developed over time as you grow and 
you have to adjust to, to where the business is taking you. Absolutely. So um, just to kind of bring it back to where we started here, uh, this conversation and where we started with in lesson one is framed around the early stages outset of a business. The IP strategy in particular, um, you know, as we'll talk about in, in some of the coming slides, uh, is important at the very start, but it's an evolving thing. And as Brett described, uh, as our business continues to evolve, we're coming up with new ideas that um, you know, have value in them for us that we think is worth protecting. And so adding new trademarks to, to the platform here as we continue to grow and come up with cool new ideas is, is part of our ongoing um, IP strategy here at Good Lawyer. And uh, you're going to be hearing from our very own IP lawyer for, uh, for the company later in the show. So stay tuned. Let's roll to the next one here, Katie. Trade secrets. So this is something that uh, I touched on um, in the context of speaking about uh, patents. Now, a trade secret um, is really, it's not uh, an official registrable form of intellectual property. Really, the easiest way uh, to think of a, of a trade secret is just something that's super, super secret within the company. Uh, it's being kept deliberately secret. It's only known by one or a small group of persons within the company. It has some sort of uh, commercial application. Uh, the best example ever of the trade secret has got to be the Coca-Cola formula. You know, if Coca-Cola were to patent its recipe, that would become uh, public knowledge and then available for knockoff in, in 20 years. So that is a, a really common cited. Um, yeah, you got it, Ash. The, the recipe for KFC is in the exact same category. There you go. Um, so that's trade secrets. Confidential information is, I would, trade secrets fit under the umbrella of confidential information. You're protecting it although it, it kind of has a, an additional layer of importance. And that really would only come into play in the context of if you had to essentially go to court to fight someone over uh, whether this particular piece of information was so fundamental, so secret, so core to um, deriving commercial uh, revenue and that kind of thing for your business that you wanted it to be classified as a trade secret so you could take extra steps to protect it and prevent somebody from putting it out in the world. It's like a super secret. Yeah, there you go. Confidential information. This is something that, you know, again, really important in our context as well. We have uh, lots of important um, kind of business metrics and, and that type of thing that we're collecting. And that's all really sensitive. It's highly valuable to us and we wouldn't want it disclosed into, uh, into the world. Yeah, and that's where you start talking about NDAs. And again, all of the IP protection, it gives you a legal tool that can be used later, but ideally just keeps people out and keeps people from taking your stuff. That's really how, how I perceive it, at least yeah. with you know the entrepreneur hat on. Perfect. It's like a big shield. Uh, let's keep going, Katie. There you go. So we've given you a very high level primer here of what is IP. And we've given you some examples of the common IP that you might encounter in your, uh, in your startup business journey here. Um, so now we're raising the question, understanding all of those features, do I need an IP strategy? And uh, essentially, why would I care about developing an IP strategy? So do you need an IP strategy? Well, uh, are you looking to establish exclusive rights to the value driver in your business? Are you looking to lock others out from being able to replicate your business model? And are you looking to be able to grow uh, value in your business idea? That's really uh, where the IP strategy comes in. Yeah, I mean, there's an argument that IP is important for every business, but there's absolutely a threshold in terms of what are your startup ambitions? You know, if there's and we're kind of expecting there to be a lot of startup founders on our startup series. So depending on what those startup ambitions look like, there's a certain level. And I assume that there's a lot of folks on this that are way beyond that in terms of their big ambitions, um, where an IP strategy is absolutely essential. There is no startup that you've heard of, you know, one of the big guys out there that, you, you know, you're all thinking of right now 
that doesn't have a meticulous IP strategy. So um, it's not for everyone, but if you have those big ambitions and you're trying to build something that people are going to want to, you know, kind of reap some of the rewards and, and lean into your brand and, and take some of the benefit, um, an IP strategy is an absolute essential. Yeah, so let's look at a few kind of concrete examples here and we'll, uh, we'll talk, talk about them a little bit and give them some color. So first one on my list here, we're talking about uh, enforcing your exclusivity and collecting damages on infringement. So uh, if I were to tie this into the good lawyer example, uh, we certainly would not want uh, other technology companies out there in the world using the name. We've got the trademark. Uh, it's really important for us to, to keep that exclusive. And if somebody was using uh, a, a similar name or a confusingly similar name and process and, and service offering, we would certainly absolutely need uh, the capability to shut that down. Letters going out the door. Yeah, you got it. Um, the second piece, and this is a, a little less relevant for us, but might be more relevant for some of your businesses. Uh, do you have a, a, a business model where you are generating revenue by licensing out your ideas, licensing out the use of your invention. Uh, if that's the case, that's how, you, that's how you've modeled out your business and how you're going to grow and make money. You absolutely need to be thinking about what is your IP strategy. Mm -hmm. um, next one, this is on every roadmap for a startup. Um, it's on our roadmap attracting investment, securing financing, whether you're talking about uh, going to uh, friends and family investors, more sophisticated institutional investors like venture capital, private equity, or a strategic investor, maybe in the same industry that you're practicing, um, you will have a hard time selling a sophisticated investor uh, to buy an ownership stake in, the, in your company unless they can see that you have a well-developed IP strategy that shows that you own the value driver in your business. And uh, for a lot of startups, the value driver in the business is the intellectual property. So if you don't have that well protected, you now become uh, a very risky investment in the eyes uh, of sophisticated uh, financing parties. Absolutely. And, and again, you know, not every business needs all the different types of IP protection. That's why we keep on emphasizing this strategy piece because it's really understanding what aspects of IP you can protect that make sense for your business and that investors are going to care about. So I'm going to keep on harping on it because, you know, good lawyer, we haven't filed any patents, you know, that would fall closer to trade secret than anything else. But for us, the brand is super, super important. So protecting that through trademarks was an absolute no brainer. And, you know, we started in Canada, but we're also getting them in the U S and, likely we'll go and uh, try to secure some international trademarks when the time makes sense. But the trademark for us was absolutely key. And that's on our IP roadmap without question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I'll, I'll just fill out that, that bullet um, a little bit more. Maybe you're not, maybe you're not seeking, you know, the um, traditional startup route where you're going to seek institutional investment but even if you're dealing with uh, more traditional lenders banking institutions that kind of thing um, again they're going to insist on these same principles because lots of times um, a traditional lender bank would not uh, advance funds unless they could secure those funds um, against your ip assets for example if, if that was a um, a valuable asset and driver of growth and value in your in your company. The last thing, and this is where I saw it the most, is in the context of selling your business. This is your. Uh, this should be the exciting, the exciting exit moment, the exciting exit strategy. You've you've done it. You've cracked the code, and you're ready to sell. And now a failure to uh, properly develop and protect your intellectual property and think through that strategy is uh, either going to grind the price and now all of a sudden yeah. you're getting way less than you had ever anticipated because there's just risk out there. Maybe you just don't own the IP and you don't have it as well buttoned up as a potential buyer would, would like. Now they're taking on some risk, so they're grinding the price. Or you're going back and you're cleaning it all up and you're increasing the transaction costs. And again, you're grinding your, you're grinding your uh, profit from the sale. And in the absolute worst case scenario, 
it's just too ugly and too hairy and too risky and you actually don't ever achieve the the transaction you never close deal breaker kids let's roll on okay. so um we've talked about what's the ip we've talked about uh essentially how you just determine and decide whether an ip strategy is right for you what we're going to talk about now are just some uh some key takeaways of what you can do to start protecting your startup's ip today and we've uh, hammered out some ip strategy essentials so the first one here that i want to hit on is uh, something that we spoke a little bit uh, during last week's lesson, lesson one, this is important at uh, right from the very beginning, before you even incorporate, we want to make sure that we're clearing and protecting the brand names that you want to use for your business right up front. So when I'm talking about clearing, what I mean is doing appropriate searches, um, either independently, but likely with the help of a lawyer to be most effective, mm -hmm. almost certainly with the help of a lawyer to make sure that, you know, before you go and create this new business, uh, that the name that you want to attribute to it and the brand that you want to start developing value in, the logo that you want to use and the website that you want to use are all free, that nobody's got that tied up and that you can, in fact, start growing and developing value in those. And not any lawyer. I am a lawyer. Josh is a lawyer and neither of us would do this ourselves. We're going to the, could we, yeah, we could get most of the way there, but not the comfort that we're looking for because we want to talk to the expert that knows exactly what they're doing, because this is something that we're going to live with for the rest of the company's life cycle. Yeah, absolutely. So we've talked about clearing. Uh, now we're going to talk about protecting and, uh, and so that's the next step is once you've identified that those, uh, those brand names, those logos, uh, those domain names are all clear and available. Well, now we want to protect them. And we've talked already about a trademark. That's one way to protect them, getting incorporated and using that name, creating a trade name. Those are other ways to protect them, locking down that website and that domain name. Um, but also when we're going through this and we're strategizing and we're making those decisions about um, locking those websites down and locking that name down and finding that trademark. Let's also think about how we plan for growth, uh, where are our customers going to be, what other jurisdictions do we want to operate in? And if the answer is uh, additional jurisdictions to Canada, then we need to think about and uh, get some advice around um, making similar filings uh, in the other jurisdictions like the US or, or places in Europe, UK, whatever it may be. And this is another great example of where an entrepreneur, a startup founder can use the law to their advantage. And I was listening to a podcast just yesterday, the Rich Barton founder of Expedia and Zillow. And he went on a deep dive on how he named things. And part of that process was making sure that he could trademark it because he recognized how important that was and coming up with these unique words. And he had some other rules too. And feel free to hit me up, Fred at goodler.ca. I'll send you the podcast. Um, but that was a key piece of his, you know, startup arithmetic when coming up with the name for the company. So um, just reiterating this, these considerations should be brought into the fold as early as you can, because they're going to set you up for success later. And uh, I, I can tell you that trying to change your business name, you know, once you're a few years deep is, is no easy thing to do. I've watched many startup founders do it, and it is a way bigger ordeal later than it is at the beginning. So um, think about it early. Absolutely. Uh, so number two here, and we're well, sticking on the theme of, uh, of thinking of it early. Um, number two is own and retain the IP in the business. Uh, and what I really want to um, kind of drill down on here is ensuring that uh, when you're in the idea stage and you're maybe you're creating a new invention and you haven't incorporated yet, we want to make sure that that value that you guys are creating um, gets transferred from the founders, the inventors into the business, because if you want to grow and develop the business, um, that business needs to be the owner uh, or at the very least have very secure licensed rights 
to that value driving intellectual property. So that's the key thing that I'm hitting on there. This is the lowest hanging fruit, folks. IP assignment from everybody that's working on, on your project should be involved, should have that IP assignment built into their contract or their employment agreement so that the business owns everything. Again, you see it time and time again, startups getting blown up because the investors coming in and they're sitting and they're asking who, who actually owns the IP. I don't see, you know, this guy worked for you for three years, but where's his IP assignment? So rectifiable sometimes, sometimes disastrous, mm -hmm. but the lowest hanging fruit, get those IP assignments built into your employment and your contractor agreements right now. Yeah. So a um, couple of things, easiest way to do it with founders. When founders are creating the company, you have to issue uh, when you've incorporated, you have to issue shares or equity in that business. Uh, we talked about that in lesson one. That's part of getting organized. So a great way to, to do that for founders oftentimes is to, in exchange for transferring intellectual property into the business, the idea, the names, whatever you've, the invention, whatever you've come up with, you're going to get equity. You're going to get an ownership share in the business in exchange for that. When you're talking about employees or contractors or other third parties that are working in the business, Brett's absolutely right. It's really, really important that you have uh, specific provisions in the agreements um, when you're engaging any of those third parties to work in your company that specifically say, you know, the intellectual property that you're creating in the context of this relationship for the business is owned by the business. Simple as that. Let's roll. Number three, determine the appropriate IP protection. Now, this one's a little bit more nuanced, but really what we're uh, suggesting here, and this is, uh, I think, one that most obviously to me screams that you need, a, you need an IP professional. You need somebody with uh, lots of experience that can help you um, make key strategic decisions at this point. Um, really what we're talking about is what are the appropriate IP protections for you? And then kind of doing a cost benefit analysis to determine, is it worth the investment? Is it worth the time? Uh, do I go with a patent? Do I go with a trade secret? Um, when do I apply in this jurisdiction versus this other jurisdiction? Can I rely on some international convention mm -hmm. to get protection uh, here while saving my, uh, you know, uh, limited capital to invest in other things. This is absolutely, absolutely the, the value that a, a trademark agent or a patent agent or an IP professional uh, can bring to, to helping scope out this phase of uh, your startup journey. And again, I'm going to say it again, comes back to the IP strategy. Bad IP is a waste of money. Good IP makes your startup more valuable, certainly to investors. Yeah. Uh, the last one, and this is another piece of low-hanging fruit, I think in my mind, is, uh, is really just thinking about safeguarding your IP in all of your day-to-day -day business activities. Uh, so here we're talking about protecting your confidential business information, your trade secrets, uh, customer data, sales data, suppliers, all of these arrangements, protecting this through the use of things like confidentiality agreements, non-disclosure agreements, restrictive covenants. Um, this is really something that you need to start developing early on and stick with through your business journey. And uh, I, I guess just to kind of add some color around that, um, whenever you're engaging with third parties and you guys uh, really fundamental piece. You should be doing it with contracts in place. And if you're going to have a contract in place, your contract should have some, some uh, attention in there devoted to how is this protecting or how is this putting at risk the IP value of my business? And we want to limit the risk wherever possible and we want to add more protections wherever possible and wherever it makes sense um you know i'll share just kind of a, an anecdote in the context of uh, a non-disclosure agreement because i think non-disclosure agreements is something that um, often gets glossed over and we think is really really simple um 
but there's two key features that I would suggest are important in the context of a, of a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, the first feature is obviously disclosure, it's in the name, but the second feature is use. And I think the use one is really important and often uh, gets glossed over. So non-disclosure just basically means, Brett, you and I have an NDA, you can't disclose, I don't want you to share that information with anybody. Use mm -hmm. is the second piece which says, Brett, I'm sharing this information with you for the specific context of helping you and I negotiate this business deal that we're trying to come to. And so your use of the confidential information that I'm sharing with you is limited to assessing, negotiating, and coming to an agreement for this deal that we're trying to get to. If I don't add that in there, I've now shared with Brett all of this great, uh, important confidential information about my business. And I've said, you can't disclose it to anybody. And he says, yeah, no problem. I now have seen under the hood of your business. I think you got a great business. Uh, rather than doing this I think deal. I can build that business exactly yeah so don't uh, don't gloss over that don't expose yourself to that kind of risk so um, yeah disclosure and use in the context of uh, NDAs restrictive covenants I want to flesh that one out a little mm -hmm. bit too so use uh, limiting use is a bit of a restrictive covenant well not a bit it is a restrictive covenant um, but I also want to flesh that out in the context of your employment agreements and in the context of independent contractor agreements. Uh, we want to make sure we have some restrictive covenants in there that prevent, um, that prevent your employees and your independent contractors from being able to use your important intellectual property like um, customer lists and sales data and that kind of thing in the context of future relationships and future engagements that, that they might have. So if you lose an independent contractor or if you lose an employee, you want to make sure that you have appropriate protections that prevent them from using the information that they know about your business in their new employment engagement or in their new contractual engagement. I talked a lot there. Okay, let's keep going. Oh, we're on to pre-submitted questions. Perfect time. That means I made it. Yeah, you get to take a little breather before we uh, start going rapid fire on all the audience questions. So folks, I'm going to play a couple answers that we got from RIP Lawyer, who is available, I'm sure, to book right now over Good Lawyer. Um, she just gave us a couple one-minute snippets for these guys. And then uh, we're going to share uh, our special startup series offer for any of the folks that are, you know, are ready to kind of take that next step and get answers to these questions on demand um, from their dedicated lawyer. Uh, and then we're going to just rock and roll on audience questions for the last 10 minutes. So, uh, Katie, let's, uh, let's go to the first one. Okay. Do you want to just read it out loud, Josh? Yes, but I have to move this thing here. We're set up in our new Vancouver uh, temporary office. So bear with us just for a moment, folks. Okay, question one. For a digital product, should I register a trademark in Canada when almost all of my customers are outside of Canada? Let's see what Alex has to say. Okay, that it may be easier than typing the whole thing out. So the first question for a digital product, should I register a trademark? Uh, Short answer is that it depends on whether they actually want any protection in Canada. Because it's not just about where their customers are located now, but what they want to do in the future. The trademark registration gives them protection, national protection in Canada. So if they're looking to protect in Canada, then yes, they should register in Canada. Plus, if they don't register by default of trademark law, you still are entitled to some sort of trademark protection if you don't have a registered one, but you are bound by common law. And common law only lets you protect your trademark in an area where you have established a reputation. So if they technically don't have any customers in Canada, then they wouldn't even be able to rely on common law to protect trademark, which then means that if they really want any kind of trademark protection in Canada, then they should file it. I hope that was okay. question with the very interesting. So to, to summarize, uh, 
you're not protected in Canada uh, without registering in this particular case. And even the common law trademark protection wouldn't likely apply here because what we're saying is um, the trademark is being used and shared uh, and accessed by customers outside of Canada. So there is no uh, kind of pattern of use of the trademark in Canada. So if you need the protection here in Canada, it sounds like the answer is um, file and register in Canada. Yeah. Number two. Okay, this is a little bit longer one. So if someone owned a web domain for 10 plus years and the web page exists but is not active, will I be able to claim that domain name using the UDRP after I trademark the name? How likely is the chance of winning? Um, this is uh, an issue that we're very familiar with over here. Somebody uh, in America owns goodlawyer.com and uh, doesn't want to give it to us. So uh, I, feel, I feel the person uh, who's looking for this answer and let's see what Alex has to say. It's web domain for 10 plus years. It, it depends because it's trademark and web domains are two different things. I mean, somebody could have purchased a website and then not operate a the business, which in that case, yeah, they probably could try to squeeze out this person for inactivity. But then if somebody just has a web domain, but are still operating a company, like a lot of lawyers don't even have a website, for example, and they're operating their business, then in theory, there isn't much trademark protection there because that person was still there first. So if their question is coming at it from a trademark perspective, which it sounds like it is, then the inactivity of the web domain is not enough to establish that this person is not actually utilizing the name of the business. It needs to be everything, just that they don't even have any activity or any customers or any reputation in order for them to try to claim this inactivity aspect. Otherwise, the UDRP is really just for the web domain and if it's there to settle disputes, um, but how likely is it that there's a chance of winning? It, it's hard to say because it depends on why the, the website was purchased, why it's inactive, why the person is still renewing it after all this time, right? Even though they don't actually use it for anything. All right, folks. So that was just a taster. And uh, like I said, that's Alex. She's one of our the rock stars on Good Lawyer. And uh, I'm going to show you an offer so you have a way to talk to her um, for as many advice sessions as you need. So Katie, um, let's get into the, the quick story and then, uh, we'll roll with, uh, questions and folks, we'll, we'll stick around for a few after. So don't feel like it's going to cut off right at, uh, well in Vancouver, right at three o'clock. So we'll, uh, we'll get through as many questions as we can. And I expect we can hang out an extra 10 minutes or so. So no sweat there. So if you need to protect your IP, uh, we want to present two different stories here. One is law firm Larry. A few months ago, it could have been law firm Josh. And uh, the other one is good lawyer Grace. Or as I mentioned, uh, you could replace Grace with Alex. And uh, if you were me, you'd be pretty happy. Katie, yeah, thank you. So this is the old school model. This is the story of law firm Larry. And uh, just to keep it nice and simple, we stuck with 15 minute calls once a month. Um, I know a lot of entrepreneurs need more legal help than that, but just to keep it simple, if you were to talk to Larry at the law firm for 15 minutes a month, that would be 0.3 billable hours. Yes, firms round up and 0.3 billable hours a month comes to 3.6 on the year. So at my old rate, which was lower than the one you left with, um, 400 bucks, times 3.6, we're talking about over $1,400 to talk to Larry 15 minutes a month through the traditional law firm, certainly the big law firm. Um, not to mention, you didn't know that price up front and you get the surprise bill in the mail. Yeah. That was our old world and this is our new one. So the story of good lawyer Grace is a little different. Uh, you also call Grace once a month for 15 minutes, but on good lawyer that costs 39 bucks a pop. And that's one of our staple micro legal services along with our $25 per page contract reviews, but it's upfront, it doesn't change, and there are no surprises on the back end. So if you were gonna talk to Grace once a month for 15 minutes, 
you'd be looking at $468 and you'd be paying that by credit card. But we've got something a little better because <laughs> maybe you want to talk to Grace or Alex more than 15 minutes a month. And that's why we built Pro. So Pro, uh, our regular price on that's 447 and that is unlimited legal advice sessions. Now that's not to be confused for unlimited legal everything, but whenever you have a question, you know you have support and you don't just have one lawyer, you have the power of the whole good lawyer network. You keep going back to Alex or, at, or Grace as much as you want, but you need somebody in a different area of law, we can make that happen. We cover everything in the startup entrepreneur realm from front to back. So the good lawyer pro annual also comes with a reduction in the service fee. So you get a nice discount on all the services through the platform. And then you get access to our VIP legal concierge. Um, and they're literally there to take care of you. So um, that's good lawyer pro. But for the folks that are coming to our startup series, we whipped up something even more special. So um, this is going to be our startup series pro offer. Um, we're going to be running it throughout the startup series. Um, not the entire time. So, you know, don't hesitate. I, I would encourage you to jump on this right away. Um, if you think that you need an IP strategy, because this, that's what this is designed for. This is designed for startup founders and entrepreneurs who want to grow their business and they got to be aware of the legal hurdles and opportunities that are in front of them along the way. And I got really tired when I was at the big firm, entrepreneurs and bankers and everyone, they were scared to call me because they knew as soon as they did, I flicked my timer on and uh, then someone else took care of sending the bill, frankly. I never even saw that piece of it, but um, we know that entrepreneurs are scared to call lawyers because the billable hours suck and Good Lawyer Pro just reduces that concern entirely. And if you want to start developing your IP strategy, this is perfect for you. So anything to add or should we jump into the Q&A? Well, I'll just add, add one thing. Uh, if, if you've made it through today's presentation and you've identified that, yeah, IP is, is core to my business, I now understand what maybe the, some of the different features of IP I might be dealing with. Um, I definitely want to grow my business and maybe one day I want to sell it to Google or Amazon or Facebook or whatever it may be. So now I know that I need a, an IP strategy. Um, you need a lawyer to help you with your IP strategy. Uh, you need an expert lawyer. You don't need me. You don't need Brett. You need somebody like Alex. Um, and the best way to get somebody like Alex is through Good Lawyer Pro. So that's, that's the story that we're leaving you with. Awesome. Let's jump to the Q and A. And uh, again, folks, thanks so much for coming out. This has been a lot of fun today coming at you from a, a slightly different background than normal. And uh, you'll get to see us in our new office uh, in a couple of weeks, <laughs> the uh, webinar background number three. So on to the Q and A's. Uh, can companies trademark colors? Kind of. <laughs> you can trademark colors in connection with you know, the overall design. So I think uh, in the context of, uh, of Good Lawyer, part of our, part of our trademark includes the, the color green that is associated with, uh, with the word mark, but you, you cannot own uh, a, specific, uh, a specific color in isolation. Great answer. And these are gonna be quick hitters folks. So keep them coming and we'll, we'll try to get to yours. Uh, is trademark copyright, et cetera, effective in Canada and US or are there separate processes for each country? Separate processes. So essentially uh, intellectual property is governed on a national level. Um, there are international treaties which uh, bind together um, the intellectual property regimes of uh, many of the different countries that are party to these treaties. Essentially, the way a lot of these treaty rules work is that, um, say you register uh, a patent or a trademark in Canada, uh, let's say the effective date of that is uh, June 1, 2021. Um, what a lot of these treaties do is they give you now a window, it may be six months, it may be a year, uh, to go and make a filing in another jurisdiction. And if that other jurisdiction is a, a party to that international treaty, they will recognize the June 1st, 2021 
uh, filing date as the as the initial registration date, even though um, that registration took place in Canada, uh, the US uh, IP registry system will recognize that as the effective date of filing in the United States. But um, yeah, different systems, they are kind of loosely tied together through international treaty systems for nuance and detail around timelines, six months, one year, whatever it may be. Uh, you definitely got to connect with uh, an IP expert to, to uh, get that detail. Marnie, I don't think we have the answer to this one, but I'll ask it anyway. Do you recommend a WIPO proof token for date or timestamp? Yeah, so uh, there are a number of different companies out there that do some of this proof token timestamp work. Um, I can't think of any of them off the top of my head, um, but an IP expert, one of the IP lawyers through the platform will absolutely be able to answer that question or at least point you in, the, in a better direction. Because again, I know that the time stamping is important. The most effective way to do that, I talked to an IP expert if I was you. Um, copyright, does it need legal registration? I think you know the answer to that one. Are you going to throw me a little softball? <laughs> uh no it does not copyright is created the instant you create the work um again the key is proof proving when the work was created registration is always an excellent way to do that um but there are some of these other mechanisms out there uh so it's really about proving when it's created because the copyright itself legally comes up immediately upon creation. That's right. So the registration, Nailed. yeah, the registration gives you a better proof, a better way to tell your story down the line if you found somebody was uh, potentially ripping off your copyrighted work. Who wins? The person who registers first or the one who can prove a timestamp of first use? Who? I think we're talking about in the context of uh, copyright. I don't know. In the terms of copyright, I would say yes. I think that that is, again, not legal advice, general information. Talk to a good IP lawyer um, for the specifics on your situation. But my thinking is that for copyright, that proof of first use would work, whereas trademark, it is way harder. So um, copyright's one of those things where the registration is kind of, in my mind, a little belts and suspenders sometimes, whereas trademark, is a totally different story because registering your trademark, so your brand, your logo, your catchphrase gives you protection right across the country, as opposed to the common law, which gives you a trademark around the little territory or the larger territory where people know you, but they but you have to prove that people know you. And I can assure you that proving that, ask West Edmonton Mall, it happened to them 20 years ago. I remember that from law school. Uh, it cost them a hell of a lot more money to prove that than it would have to register the trademark at first instance. So, yeah, I would say in this context, uh, if we're if we're thinking of trademark, if if you have a, a trademark, a business name uh, that that you want to create a registered trademark for, um, and you go and you look and you search the registry and you and you go through that process and you identify that it's open, it it is not registered but you know that that mark is being used in the market and it's being used in a way that would be confusing with the trademark that you want to register. Um, it might be a cheaper idea to pick a different name, to come up with a different mark before you register, before you start creating value in it. That's part of that, uh, that's part of that clearance and vetting process that we talked about before. For a code base that evolves, would you periodically re-register? Honestly, I said like a pat. Again, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this again. Talk to an IP expert for your specific problems. If you want to take good lawyer first spin, if you talk to one of our LC guys, we can make sure that we connect you. Um, but my thinking on that is, I probably wouldn't be registering the code. Copyright does exist in code, but from my limited understanding of how code works and how copyright works, which is, you don't need to tweak the copyright. A crazy amount for the copyright to no longer up, hold up and it, and if you're dealing with a work of art more traditionally like a poem a story it's easier 
to conceptualize how you know you have to material change materially change the copyrighted work to get around it which is more challenging whereas my understanding with code is it can start looking pretty different and still functioning quite alike so um you definitely can copyright code and we've seen it done um but re-registering the code on an ongoing basis is not something that i think i would recommend we don't do it um if you're stripe and you've got your seven lines of perfect code that's definitely registered somewhere but as you're building an mvp and working through and iterating uh i wouldn't worry so much much about registering your copyright on that timestamp will be good though okay can ideas be copyrighted even before the mvp is made ready ideas cannot be copyrighted you have to put something down on paper. That's where copyright is created. So if it's just a, a theory or a beautiful idea that's circulating in your mind, uh, there's no real way to establish ownership or authorship over that. So um, your idea uh, only really becomes protected by an intellectual property right of copyright once you put it down someplace. Again, uh, the trick then becomes uh, about establishing um, the facts and circumstances that you were the first one to come up with it and, and proving that, uh, that that's your idea. Yeah. Uh, got a good question here from uh, Malika. Can you talk about IP for a service-based company like Good Lawyer? I realize you're saying that it has underlying products. Any advice for companies where the differentiation, differentiation is in the service? I do. And if you're building a company like we are built on service and, you know, customer loyalty, because we are just bending over backwards to make sure everybody gets the help they need. Brand brand becomes super important. And the way that we're uh, protecting that primarily is through trademarks. So if you're building a company and your service is the best service, and that's what you want people to remember, then I would say a brand uh, protector, like a trademark is what you're looking for. Anything else? No, that's straight yeah. from the good, good. startup founders' yeah. uh, lips. There, that's as good as it gets. Uh, how can we keep a trade secret? Say, if the employee knows the secret, if he goes outside and shares it, how can we enforce it? Uh, I can break for that a little bit. Yeah. So the idea with um, trade secrets, and this is where I was talking about before, maybe a little bit cryptically about how it's differentiated from confidential information. Um, really, it, the differentiation plays out in this particular context where you are uh, trying to enforce the particular trade secret against maybe an, uh, a now former employee who's potentially out there in the market uh, sharing the information. So if the information, if you can establish and successfully argue that it's a trade secret, um, the people that had access to that trade secret in your company um, have a, a higher order of um, obligation and duty around confidentiality and secrecy imposed upon them under the law to keep that trade secret secret. So there's uh, different remedies that are available in law that you might be able to exercise against um, a now former employee that has access to a trade secret. Um, things like injunctions that would prevent them from, or where you basically have a court order preventing them from disclosing. Um, that's really uh, sort of the, the idea. You have extra ammunition to go after uh, an employee like this in the context, if it is properly classified as a trade secret because they have this higher legal onus uh, to protect the secrecy. And just a practical tip, Hiring is one of the most important things that you can do as a startup founder. So make sure that you have a thorough process and trust the people that you're bringing onto your team because it's entangled to get the right people. And if you don't, this stuff becomes so much more important. Um, but really um, having a thorough hiring process is another sort of practical way to prevent any employee theft down the road. Hire good people. Um, this one? Yeah, CAs and 
The NDAs. difference between a confidentiality agreement and a non-disclosure. Nothing really. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing at all. Uh, if they sound similar, it's because they are similar. It's just a uh, uh, naming convention that might be specific to a particular company or a particular law firm that you're working with. Uh, the concept is the same. Don't tell anybody this information that I'm sharing you, uh, sharing with you. And like I mentioned, the next important piece, only use this confidential information that I'm sharing with you for this limited specific purpose that we both agree on. Totally. One of our, one of our friends got caught talking to a much bigger distributor, shared their great idea. And next thing you know, there's a line coming out of the same name and they have virtually no recourse because they don't have anything trademark registered and their NDA didn't specify um, the use piece of it. So um, they didn't come to us until it was a little bit later than it should have been. Um, but just be careful, especially if you're dealing with folks who you know have lawyers. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to level the playing field so that the big guys don't just get to take advantage of the legal protections that are you know, for everybody. Another question here. How do you protect open source software? You don't really. I think that's kind of the point of the open source software is that you're giving it to the world. And the way, I guess the way that you would protect it is again, brand. You know, if your open source software is living somewhere, you want to protect the brand. Um, and I'm trying to think, oh, GitHub, you know, GitHub is open source, I believe to almost like to a tremendous extent. And, you know, what's GitHub's best protection? their name github everybody knows it yeah you get the you get the pop by being seen as the source of uh of the open source code or software in the first place the creator right which you've now shared totally and if i can guarantee you if there was a good lawyer github we're gonna get a notice in the mail from github telling us to knock it off might not be that nice um yvette is trademark retroactive to the first filing in the first country yeah, sort of. There are conventions. And again, this is where you want to talk to an IP expert. But for Good Lawyer, for instance, we registered in Canada, and that does save us a place in line with respect to our US application that has now been submitted. So um, you want to know the details of where you're registering. Um, but there are some rules that facilitate wherever you register first, like between Canada and the US, you get to use that data filing mm -hmm. if you do it right. So talk to an expert and you know I'll just say it again folks if you think you need an IP strategy you should be a pro there's no question this is not a one time oh I've dealt with my IP stuff your IP stuff evolves as your business evolves so if you think you need an IP strategy can't harp on it again this is the best offer we're ever going to do so uh, highly highly encourage you to check it out yeah you bet this one touches on what I was mentioning before we have these uh international treaties that link all these different IP regimes in different countries. Um, so Brett's point, uh, good lawyer registers the trademark here in Canada, also wants to register the trademark in the United States. Uh, we have a limited window of time to complete the, or to file the registration in, in the United States, which will make sure that that US registration recognizes the first filing date of the Canadian jurisdiction. If you miss that time period, you're not dead in the water. It, there's still likely value um, in registering in, in other jurisdictions. You're just not going to get the benefit of the first filing date in Canada in the example that I used. Yeah, this is a good one. Um, how long can I prevent an employee from using technical data from my company? Uh, this is uh, a good question, and I'll just kind of address it more generically in the context of restrictive covenants. And we're talking about including restrictive covenants in uh, agreements with employees and independent contractors to ensure that they are um, not using your sensitive intellectual property, your sensitive confidential information in um, in future employment roles or business engagements that they're involved in. Uh, part of the challenge and balance here is that you want those restrictive covenants to be robust enough that they protect you, 
but you want them to be uh, limited to a point where they are in fact enforceable. If you do have to uh, say, pull out the, the nuclear option of having to enforce it in the context of a litigation. Um, so that's something that is really fact dependent. It's fact dependent on you know, who the particular employee is, the, the nature of the confidential information itself, really the facts and circumstances of, of each situation is unique and relevant to determining what in fact might be uh, enforceable and reasonable in those in that case. So uh, you'll have to uh, connect with a lawyer here through the platform and share some of that uh, detailed information and then they can help advise at what might be appropriate for those uh, circumstances. Awesome. Well, folks, um, maybe the last one I'll just touch on do PE and VC firms use IP protection? Guaranteed. Andreessen Horowitz has a trademark for sure. Yeah. I haven't looked that up, but I it would be shocking to me. Again, it's one of those things. Weighing, balancing, weighing. The trademark is the one that I'm most familiar with. And it gives you the national protection that you know we were certainly after because we want to, you know, be a nation, a nationwide and then beyond that company. So um, you would never get that unless you register the trademark. And that's what I would anticipate a venture capitalist would be looking to register if they were trying to protect their intellectual property. Yeah, it's no different. So, you know, principle number one uh, that we talked about uh, in, in the context of, you know, essential elements of, of rolling out your IP strategy, uh, you do the clearing and the vetting process, and then you protect the name, you protect the brand, you protect the IP before you start developing value in it. And um, you don't wanna go down the road of developing a bunch of value in the IP and event, uh, in the brand and the name only to find out that while you were doing that, somebody else registered the trademark, uh, stole your name, and now you have to go out and um, change the name and try to bring that value with you. Yeah. All right, folks, I think me and Josh are...